Um, this week we have a talk from Shota Ichihashi uh, from the Bank of Canada. Um, the format for those of you who don't know is that Shota is going to talk um, for about 40 minutes. Um, he said that he's very happy to take questions as he goes along, so you can just pop those into the chat. Um, and then after Shotter's talk, we will have a discussion from Thomas Cervaletti uh, for about five minutes, um, and then time for some open Q&A. And as usual, at the one hour mark, I will stop the recording, um, but anybody who wants to hang around a little bit longer for an informal chat um, is welcome to do so. So to get the ball rolling, let me hand over to Shotter, who's going to talk to us about addictive platforms. Uh, all right, so thanks Greg for the introduction. Uh, thanks everyone for coming to my presentation. So today I'm gonna talk about competition for consumers' attention. And uh, this is my joint work with Byung Cho Kim. We are surrounded by these amazing digital products and they have a monetary price of zero because they are supported by advertising revenue. So the more time we spend on the service, the more ads they can display and earn higher revenue. So their incentive will be to provide a service on which we wanna spend more time or in other words, more attention. But there is recently a growing concern for consumers, policymakers, and even for the tech industries about this firm's incentive to capture users' attention. Roughly speaking, the idea is that these firms may have an incentive to design various aspects of the services to increase users' attention in a way that may not necessarily benefit users. For example, a platform may adopt a certain content recommendation algorithm, which just learns and display whichever content I'm most likely to click, regardless of the underlying quality of the news, like its credibility. Or a platform, a social media platform may adopt a certain notification system, which keeps telling teen users how great their classmates are doing every single minute. At least intuitively, these features may increase the time that users spend on the platform, but it's unclear whether it is it should be regarded as high quality and it benefits users. Now, motivated by this recent discussion, we are consider a model of competition for consumers' attention. A novelty is that a firm has a strategic variable with which they can degrade the service quality and make it, make it more capable of capturing consumers' attention. So we allow a firm to sacrifice quality for consumer attention and examine the impact of competition. In particular, I'm gonna show you a condition under which competition harms consumers compared to monopoly. I'm gonna also talk about potential policy remedies as well as the importance of the platform's revenue models in deriving our conclusion. All right, so let me jump into the model. There are K platforms. I use K for the number and the set of the platforms. And there is a single consumer. Uh, let me just say upfront, uh, we are not going to see any uncertainty or any behavioral component. Although in the extension, we consider a particular behavioral assumption. For most of the talk, we consider a perfect information plus rational consumer. Now, in the stage one of this model, each platform small k chooses the strategic variable called addictiveness denoted by d of k, which is any non-negative scale. Then the consumer joins platforms and allocates our attention. So suppose each platform has already determined this dk, and let me focus on the detail of the consumer's participation and attention allocation. Okay, in the second stage, consumer chooses the set of platforms to join, and he said J, and for each platform she has joined, the consumer decides how much attention AK to allocate. And we allow multi-homing so the consumer can potentially join any set of platforms. The consumer's eventual payoff is the benefit of using the service minus what we call attention cost. So the consumer's benefit of joining platforms in K is a sum of the utility coming from each platform she has joined 
And this UAKDK depends on how much time the consumer spends on the platform K and this DK chosen by the platform K. But the consumer also incurs a attention cost, which is a function only of the total attention the consumer has spent across the services. And this is weekly increasing, weekly convex and differentiable. In addition, the consumer faces the attention constraint, which is there is some model parameter A bar such that consumer can spend at most a bar amount of total attention across the platforms. And this is gonna be the key parameter of the model. Uh, we're gonna show you a lot of comparative studies with respect to a bar. So uh, please keep this in mind. A bar is the attention cap. Now, so this is the consumer's decision. And uh, in equilibrium, one step back, each platform sets this addictiveness DK to maximize the amount of attention going to the platform. So that means one possible specification of each platform case payoff is just equal to AK. More generally, platform case payoff can depend on the entire attention allocation profile as long as it is increasing in A of K. But to solve the model cleanly, we do not allow platforms case profit to directly depend on DK. So choice of DK affects platforms profit only indirectly through the consumer's behavior, which is the main channel that we wanna study. So before going to the assumption on UAD, uh, is there any question about timing or informational assumption? Sounds good. So let me show the assumption on UAD. This is the benefit that consumer obtains from using a given platform, which is depends on how much attention she allocates and this addictiveness. As a function of attention, this service utility is increasing and concave. A U00 is non-negative, namely compared to the outside option of zero, the consumer is weakly better off by joining the platform with zero addictiveness. But point two says the level of the benefit of joining a platform is decreasing in D and it becomes negative for a sufficiently large D. However, conditional on joining, consumer will face a higher marginal utility of allocating attention when D is high. So pick any platform and plot the attention that consumer is allocating on the horizontal axis and the vertical axis is a service utility. As the platform increases the low to the high, then overall service utility function shifts downward, but gets everywhere steeper. So roughly example, consumer views the platform as a low quality, uh, less willing to join when D is high. But conditional on joining, what determines the consumer's incentive to spend time is the marginal utility. So higher D gives the stronger incentive to the consumer to spend time. Now, before, uh, if these uh, mathematical conditions are clear, uh, before going to the more general discussion, I'd like to show you one application under which these conditions hold. And I hope this application will also tell you our model can fit the situation, which is not exactly about what we imagine from the word addiction. Okay, so the example I'm gonna show you is the one of data collection. So pick any platform and suppose that upon participation, the platform requests the amount D of consumer's personal data uh, for registration, which can be the location or demographic characteristics or the contact of friends. And platform can use that information to personalize content. However, the consumer anticipates some negative consequence from collection of personal information. So consumer have a preference over how much information the platform requests. In particular, if the consumer joins the platform that collects amount D of data, consumer incurs a privacy cost of L. So for simplicity linear, positive L times D. But a platform can use data to improve the other aspects of the service. So without any data collection, consumer will face the baseline value of a service V of A, other than the privacy cost. 
but platform can use the collected information to increase the value from VA, so increasing concave, to one plus D V of A. Now, given this simple uh, functional form, if L is higher than the supremum of this bounded function V, then the level of the benefit of joining the platform is decreasing, but marginal utility of allocating attention is increasing in D. So what I mean is that exante consumer views platform as low quality when it asks for more personal information. But once the consumer joins in this application, privacy cost becomes sunk. So the consumer has a stronger incentive to spend more time on the platform that has more information. So in that case, D is not really about addictiveness, but simply how much information the platform asks for, for registering a user. Now, more generally, we wanna use this D as any choice of a firm to sacrifice the service quality for consumer's attention. Now, our paper cannot give you the direct answer of, to the question of how the firm achieves such an objective. But such a choice is likely to appear in the very complex choice of the design of user interface or the recommendation algorithm or other uh, platform design. How we summarize this complicated choice as simply a shift of the level of the utilities and marginal utilities. And this is somewhat in the spirit of competition in utilities framework. Now, this shift or divergence of U and marginal U is, will be different from the competition on other dimension like price or advertising load. For example, if a platform decides to increase advertising intensity, then so long as I view ad as this utility, this change will likely to shift both U and marginal U downward. Now, in the paper, in addition to the previous data collection application, uh, we also have the another application based on the rational addiction. This downward shift of U and upward shift of marginal utility uh, may remind you of the rational addiction. Then if that's the case, uh, you are on the point. So we consider a super simple two period model of rational addiction in which the consumer's platform consumption exhibits habit formation. So if I use platform service today, that will lower my tomorrow utility, but increase my marginal utility of spending time, just like in this Baker Murphy paper. In that case, D becomes the intensity of a habit formation. So higher D means by today's service consumption affects my tomorrow utility and marginal utility a lot. And this application also uses a certain kind of time inconsistent agent and we derive UAD as the example payoff. Now it's a little bit long application and I don't have time to go through this, but I'm happy to talk more maybe after the talk. Okay, so here is a quick motivation. And then uh, let me go to the model. So remember platforms choose simply addictiveness to maximize attention and then consumer joins the platforms and allocates attention. Uh, I'd like to begin with the simplest case of a monopoly. So monopoly chooses D to maximize consumer attention and a conditional on joining consumer chooses A to maximize this utility. And because A and D, the higher D increases marginal utility. So the consumer would choose higher A given the higher addictiveness. But of course, consumer joins only if she anticipates the non-negative payoff. So this consumer's participation incentive will bound possible D or a possibly optimal D. Now remember A bar is the attention cap of the, this the consumer side privilege. So to sum up, platform maximizes attention given consumer's incentive. Now monopoly may have multiple optimal choices of the addictiveness, but we focus on the equilibrium in which SPE in which the platform breaks tie in favor of the consumer, or equivalently, we focus on the Pareto undominated SP. And what I'm gonna show you is to show the monopolist choice of addictiveness as a comparative statics with respect to the exogenous attention cap. So attention cap is this upper bound of the total attention. Now, so here is the result. When a bar is relatively small, 
Then even if platform sets zero addictiveness, attention constraint is so tight that consumer is going to spend all of her attention able. In that case, there is no point for the monopolist to degrade service quality for attention, so D is zero. When A bar is extremely high, so think of A bar equal to infinity, then attention constraint doesn't exist. Then only attention cost exists. So monopolist wants to increase addictiveness all the way up to the point at which the consumer just gets surplus with zero, so, but still joins the platform. In that case, consumer allocates a high amount of attention, but service quality is so low that consumer surplus is zero. When a bar is somewhere in the middle, then monopolist set positive, but not too high level of addictiveness under which the consumer will strictly prefer to join the platform. So overall, as a function of an attention cap, the monopolist D, so this is the extent to which the platform sacrifice quality for attention is weakly increasing. Now, what's the welfare implication? So let me put this on the top right corner. As a bar increases, on the one hand, consumers attention constraint gets relaxed, which is good, but monopolists degrade service quality, which is bad for the consumer's perspective. So what we can show is that consumer's equilibrium payoff as a function of the attention cap is non-monotone, single peaked. Now, but what I want you to remember uh, for that talk is when a bar is relatively low, attention is relatively scarce, then as we saw in the previous slide, monopolist is going to set zero addictiveness. So for whenever parameter falls in this range below a one, we get consumer optimal outcome. Namely, monopoly equilibrium maximizes the consumer's payoff across all the strategy profiles. So this is the basic observation of the monopoly equilibrium. Let me see whether there is any question. No questions, I think. Oh, sure. Okay, so, so here we consider now competition. There are two or more platforms. Each platform maximizes attention given the participation constraints, namely each platform's incentive is qualitatively the same as a monopoly. Uh, we consider a model of a perfect information. So each platform wants to increase addictiveness so long as the consumer is willing to join. And all the consumers, they are symmetric and do the same calculation. So here is what we have. So here we have a unique SPE uh, with a little bit work. We can show uniqueness. And there, all the platforms choose the same positive addictiveness, which makes the consumer just indifferent between joining all and all but one platforms. In equilibrium, consumer joins all platforms and allocates the same amount of attention to each of them. Now, so main point here is that for any parameter, platforms choose positive addictiveness. They degrade the service quality for attention. And this is in contrast to the monopoly, which sets zero addictiveness for a small A bar. And this is because competing platforms has business dealing incentive. When A bar is very small, then monopolist has no incentive to raise D because it doesn't expand consumers' total attention. But if I have as a platform, I have a competitor, then by increasing addictiveness, I can capture a greater fraction of consumer's available attention. So this captures the fraction or the captures the attention that consumer would have allocated to my rivals, gives me an extra incentive to increase addictiveness. Now, of course, there is a competition force, which is I cannot increase D too much because then consumer will just stick to my rivals. But on balance, there is still a non-trivial business dealing incentive across all parameters leading to a positive service degradation. And this result gives a hint that there is something, some downside, maybe some downside of competition as we move from monopoly. And as a starting point, I'd like to show you the comparison of one versus two platforms. Now, everything else equal, the consumer trivially prefers duopoly because there are two services and they are differentiated. 
But in equilibrium, the result depends on the parameter. So this is only a partial comparison for the subset of parameter. When a bar is below some threshold, the consumer is strictly better off under a monopoly. When a bar is above another cutoff, the consumer is weakly better off under the monopoly. Meaning, so here is the typical graph we get, uh, even though this is a little bit more than what we are formally claiming. Now, when a bar is relatively small, then main reason for the platform to capture consumer's attention under competition is the business stealing incentive. In that case, competition reduces consumer service quality and reduces consumer welfare compared to monopoly. When a bar is relatively high, then monopolists bad incentive of increasing total attention to capture more of the consumer's total attention becomes dominant in that case, the monopoly is worse for the consumer compared to duopoly. Now, why do I have this even though duopoly has more services? Now, this is very simple. Consumer surplus under duopoly is same as the consumer surplus of just joining one platform because of the indifference condition. So consumer's payoff is greater under monopoly whenever monopoly sets lower addictiveness than any of the duopoly platform. And that's the case when attention constraint is tight or attention is relatively scarce. All right, so any question? I might have seen something in the chat box. Um, yep, so there's a question from Mariam Seedy who asks whether you've thought about the case where it's costly for firms to change the level of addictiveness. Uh, yes, so I have two answers. When each platform sets a very small but positive epsilon cost, of choosing a positive addictiveness. So like a discrete investment in choosing positive addictiveness, then uh, all the result continues to hold. Uh, indeed, we get a unique equilibrium even under monopoly. And I think it's natural also to think increasing say convex addictiveness. In that case, we haven't obtained a clear result. Yeah, just that monopolies are the platform taking into account consumers that part, uh, attention allocation incentive. So we have to tweak around the first order condition and get second or third order derivative. So we haven't obtained a clear equilibrium prediction. Yeah, thank you. So I, I, I just think that uh, in your second case, then uh, especially with duopoly, you probably will have multiple equilibria with one putting low efforts with low level of D and the other with high. So you might have multiple equilibria in that case. Oh, so for all the costly investment. Yeah, so for costly yeah. investment, especially if like it's uh, costlier to uh, increase the level of D. Mm -hmm. yeah, as, yes. uh, as a, another paper probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 that, that's a good point, right. So once was introduced cost, uh, we see that like the, I don't have an immediate intuition of whether a choice of Ds become complement or substitute. But yeah, I, I can imagine the intuition where there could be multiple or asymmetric equilibria. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I've shown you this monopoly duopoly comparison. Now more generally, one step ahead, we can ask, can monopoly continue to dominate more competitive markets? Or once we consider a sufficiently high degree of competition, are we going to see vanishing addictiveness in equilibrium. So does that high degree of competition eliminates this problem. Now, we could keep adding more and more platforms. So consider more and more market entry and consider the bigger and bigger market. But we didn't take this approach. Instead, what I'm gonna show you from now on is to consider a fixed market size. And then imagine consider the sequence of markets which gets more and more competitive, namely, I'm gonna see more and more platforms with smaller and smaller in size. So purpose is to exclude the variety expansion effect of competition and focus on the other effect of the competition, which is each firm has a smaller influence on the aggregate market. And here is the formalization. So we consider a sequence of markets, one, two, da, da, da. They have the same size, but as the index increases, they get growingly complicated. 
Now, for any given market, the model is exactly the same as a monopoly uh, as uh, before, but we just normalize markets across uh, different index indices to capture the idea of constant market size. Now, market one is what we saw at the beginning, monopoly market with service utility UAT. For any positive integer K, market K has K platforms. Each platform offers not UAD, but one over K times U of KA times D. Now, this, the paper we show that this is indeed a unique way of normalizing the primitive service utility to capture the idea of constant market size. Uh, one way to see this is that if the consumer is in market K and she pick total attention A and divides it equally across the K platforms, then direct substitution shows the consumer's gross total utility is U of capital A of D. Uh, super importantly, this is independent of the K. Uh, this is the sense in which this is constant market size formulation. For example, maximum consumer surplus doesn't change even if we increase K. The consumer side of primitive like attention cost or constraint continue to be the same. For any given market, we can apply the previous result to solve equilibrium. Then let's see how the equilibrium changes across K. Now, so if this is clear, uh, last bit of notation. A of D is the total attention the consumer is gonna choose when she is in any market K and platforms set same addictiveness D. For example, in market say 20, if the older platforms choose the same D, consumer allocates AD over 20 to each of the 20 platforms. Then beyond duopoly, the equilibrium addictiveness is weakly decreasing in K and it eventually converges to some positive level that uniquely solves this equation. So competition beyond the duopoly weakly improved the situation for the consumer, but even in the limit, we are going to the D infinity, uh, some positive limit addictiveness. And this equation captures the consumer's participation incentive in limit economy. So imagine consumer faces a large number of infinitesimal farms. Now, if the consumer decides not to join a platform, one platform, consumer is gonna lose the service utility of U, A, of D. But there is a gain. Let's say consumer decides not to join one platform and she saves 10 minutes. The consumer can reallocate the saved 10 minutes to other services that consumer has already joined and earn 10 minutes times marginal utility from other platforms. Now in equilibrium, the consumer is indifferent between joining and not joining each platform conditional on joining all other platforms. So these two terms must coincide, namely there is no net gain or loss of walking away from each platform. We can also see that this equation basically says average utility is equal to the marginal utility. And for this to be true for the concave function, there has to be some uh, downward shift uh, to, for this equa equality to satisfy. Okay, so in addition to this qualitative insight, uh, what's good about this result is that this equation is very tractable. For any finite K, there are lots of the problem of which constraint binds, but for the limit, we can directly solve this equation in some special cases. In the paper, we consider a several uh, assumption on the functional form and solve the analytically solve the equilibrium for the limit outcome. But here I'm gonna show the welfare implication on the consumer's payoff. So what I'm gonna do is to derive the infinity, calculate consumer surplus, and call this the consumer surplus in the limit economy and compare it with monopoly. Now, first, uh, let's consider a quadratic attention cost, CA squared over two with exponential utility. So this A minus D captures all the assumption that I introduced at the beginning. Now, consumer surplus is greater under monopoly than the limit economy if and only if this total amount of attention available to the consumer is above some known threshold. So this is again, 
constant market size formation. And this is the typical graph we get. Namely, as a function of attention capacity, both consumer surpluses under monopoly and limit economy are non-monotone and single peak. But there is a unique cutoff at which monopoly curve crosses limit economy consumer surplus from above uh, only once. So if and only if attention is relatively scarce, then downside of the competition of this business stealing becomes a dominant force, in which case, as we move from monopoly to the limit economy, consumer surplus uh, gets lower. Otherwise, a monopoly is better. Uh, indeed, eventually limit economy gives a positive surplus, but no monopoly gives consumer zero surplus. So this is a one instance, just to show the full comparison across all possible A bar. We also consider the linear attention cost because we have a slightly different welfare implication. So large CA is small c times A, and UAD is V of A minus D for some increasing and concave V with some uh, condition on the deriva derivative at zero to get non-trivial non result. In that case, we get the un ambiguous welfare compass. There is a unique cutoff A star such that when attention capacity is below the threshold, consumer is strictly better off under monopoly than the limit economy. Now remember, beyond the duopoly, more competition leads to lower addictiveness and higher service quality. So point one implies whenever A bar is below A star, consumer surplus is higher under monopoly than any market K. Otherwise, if A bar is above A star, consumer surplus is zero in all markets. So this is a typical graph. So the main difference from the previous one is that as we move from a monopoly to a more competitive market, consumer surplus curve shifts downward uniformly. So the competition never strictly benefits the consumer across all the parameters. Now, it's kind of intuitive that why linear attention cost makes competition less effective. For example, if attention cost is linear, namely, even if I use one platform, I continue to face the same marginal cost C of using other platforms. Then when a bar is extremely high, then consumers uh, participation and allo attention allocation decision becomes separable across the platforms. In which case each platform acts like a monopolist and consumer gets zero surplus, but allocates high attention. But indeed this kind of comparison are uniformly hold for all A. All right, so this is the basic result on the impact of competition. We saw that relative to a monopoly, competition for scarce attention can harm consumers because when farms compete for a smaller pie, their main incentive to increase addictiveness is to steal attention from their rivals. Now, so how can we, uh, what can we do in terms of the policy? So here we fix market structure and ask what kind of policy can improve consumer surplus, assuming we cannot directly control D. Uh, we're gonna show you two somewhat unconventional policies. One is to restrict consumer's platform usage, sometimes called digital curfew. So this is one of the graphs I showed you before. We can see that from a high A bar, as we reduce A bar to a smaller number, then this increases consumer surplus. And this policy is more effective for a monopoly than in the more competitive market. Uh, what we show in the paper is that the condition under which exogenously reducing attention cap upfront can improve consumer's equilibrium welfare. And that's uh, the sense in which com uh, this reducing A bar tends to be more effective in a less competitive market. Now, our, the consumer in our model is rational, so there is no self-control problem, but reducing A bar still discourages farms from increasing D. So lower A bar can go to the high, lower D, higher service quality and higher consumer welfare. The other policy implication would be that if we 
see the result literally, it means that under certain condition, namely when a bar is small, merger to a monopoly can improve consumer welfare. Maybe tech CEO love this, and this may sound very extreme, but main takeaway is that a merger could mitigate firms' business stealing incentive, which in turn can mitigate their incentive to degrade service quality for capturing consumer attention, which may eventually lead to the better consumer surplus. In the paper, we consider a bit more general class of mergers and discuss what kind of merger can benefit or harm the consumer. Now, finally, <laughs> we discuss the role of the platform's business model. Uh, for the moment, we consider a very simple comparison. Previously, we started with a model in which platform earns revenue only from attention. Here, we consider a model in which platform can set a participation fee, monetary price that consumer has to pay upon joining platform K. And also we modify the platform's payoff function so that it no longer earns revenue from a consumer's attention. So this is not the model in which the, we add monetary price as an additional revenue source to our original model because platform don't get any revenue from attention. Now in equilibrium, platform always prefer to decrease addictiveness, offer higher service quality and charge higher monetary price. So we're gonna see zero addictiveness with a positive monetary price. Trivially, monopoly now minimizes the consumer surplus because monopoly sets price equal to the consumer's gain of joining the service, leaving the surplus of zero to the consumer. Because again, we are in the perfect information model. But now one question which is non-trivial is how does the consumer welfare change as we move from attention competition model to this pure price competition model. On the one hand, consumer is going to see better service quality, but on the other hand, they have to pay. Uh, here is a condition under which consumer is better off under attention competition. So in the normalized market K, consumer is strictly better off under attention competition if the attention cost is strictly convex, say quadratic, and K is sufficiently large, so market is sufficiently competitive. Or market is monopoly and attention is relatively scarce. In that case, we get strict welfare comparison. Now, so let me show the intuition of point one. When market is competitive, consumer is better off under attention competition. Idea is that whichever attention competition or price competition we consider, Consumer's net utility from any given platform is determined by her outside option. For example, consumer payoff from a platform under price competition, this is the service utility minus price, is determined by the be benefit of walking away and reallocating attention to other platforms she has already joined. Now, under attention competition, so we have the similar expression, but attention competition has a higher addictiveness, which leads to a higher marginal utility, which implies higher incremental gain of walking away from a platform and continuing to use other services. So this better outside option forces the platforms to offer a better net utility, either net of the service degradation or net of the monetary price. So as a result, consumer can be better off under attention competition in a competitive market. But now this particular result, price versus attention, depends on the consumer being rational. So it misses the force under which we may think, well, there may still a good point about price competition. In the paper, we consider a naive consumer in a sense that the consumer wrongly underestimate the true addictiveness D as S of D for some exogenous parameter S between zero and one. This underestimation uh, generally increases equilibrium addictiveness, but qualitatively we get uh, pretty much the same result. Except if S is small, namely consumer is naive, consumer surplus tends to be higher under attention price competition than attention competition. Okay, so I think it's a good time to recap. 
Uh, but so the literature, uh, I don't think I have time to go through this, but uh, if you have any existing economic intuition that we can relate our result to, uh, we'd love to hear uh, there you are. Now, I think there have been an idea that attention economy could distort the kind of services provided to the market. Uh, we try to formulate this idea and uh, speak to it by introducing a new strategic variable, capturing the firm's incentive to degrade the quality and uh, make it more effective in capturing consumers' attention. Competition could mitigate or exacerbate this problem but probably the novel part is competition for scarce attention, tight attention constraint can lead to the more service degradation and lower consumer welfare. Uh, among other things, restricting consumers platform usage could mediate a problem, even though the consumer is rational. Uh, this is all I have. Uh, thank you for your attention. I'm uh, looking forward to the Thomas's discussion. Thank you very much, Shota. So yes, now we will have a brief discussion from Timothy Valetti. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the organizers for having me discuss this great paper by Shota. So it is about the attention economy. It's a very important topic. In a sense, um, attention is the ultimate scarce resource. It's our time, you know? we've got 24 hours a day. And if you think about recent transactions, for instance, the recent merger between Google and Fitbit, you're talking about a wearable operation system, which is attached to our body 24 hours a day, which will try, according to some, to understand our mood, our emotions. And some argue that they, they will even be able to manipulate that mood and those emotions. So this is not a dystopic future, this is happening right now. If you think about the business model of YouTube or Facebook, it's about you know, engagement, as the companies call it. It's about showing us stuff that keep us hooked as long as possible, as long as uh, the right signal is extracted to show us some ads. And so, and typically this content is related to very you know, divisive um, politics or sex or violence. And so you may not even like it, but it's really difficult to get away from it. And um, the, the big tech companies are engaging continuously in A-B experimental testing to uncover some behavioral biases. They can even um, you know, um, target particular consumers at a particular point in time when they are more likely to give good reviews about products. There is steering, so they're gonna, so people are thinking whether it is there or is there not discrimination, but we think about price discrimination, but there is different kinds of dis discrimination. So it can be steering, showing you things that other cannot see, showing you things that when you're in a certain emotional state, there is even a branch in marketing, which is called vulnerable marketing. So which is about, uh, you know, it's marketing devoted to people which are either vulnerable as a group or in a vulnerable state. So it's important that economists are aware that this is happening. It's not just a theoretical possibility. If you're interested in many of these examples, there is a very recent informative report by the UK CMA, the Competition and Market Authority, called Algorithms. How can they how they can reduce competition and harm consumers? So again, it's a it's an excellent document because it opens up a lot of research questions for us economists that have not been answered yet. So, as I said, companies themselves uh, are interested in, in, in addiction. They would never call it addiction, of course, the college engagement. So it's, a, it's a fine line between addiction and engagement, but the, it's a, the first metric, it's the first KPI that companies have is engagement. So how much time can you keep people online? So, and just uh, and these these numbers are very relevant. If you think of Facebook, on average, an American consumer spends about an hour and a half on Facebook, uh, over an hour and something on Instagram, which is owned by the same company, and a bit less on WhatsApp. So we're talking about the average, okay? And then there is lots of heterogeneity. We're talking about three hours a day on a certain platform ecosystem. That's a lot of work. So this is it's very important. I've been doing recent work with uh, Andre Vega recently 
uh, we teamed up with a software company called Lumen, and they, this is eye tracking software, which is trying to understand whether or not you dwell on an ad according to the content that is shown next to the ad. So, and this is a, a typical technology which is used a lot uh, by the marketeers. So it's, um, it's really relevant in practice. The paper itself is, um, in a sense, is simple, and it generates a lot of results. So this is what a good model is about. So not doing something complicated, it's extremely rich, the set of results that you can, you can, you can get. And it also has the right ingredients that we are thinking about in economics, the business model matters. It, is it about advertising funded platforms versus paid for business models? What's still missing there is what is leading a particular company to adopt one business model? Because you're just positing exogenously if they are all ad funded or all paid for. And we would like to understand what is leading the choice of a business model vis-a-vis -vis the other. Some more specific remarks about the paper. It's a great title. I love the title. In terms of the literature, you, of course, you do cite to the first generation of seminal works on two-sided markets, but I do remember that the work of Simon Anderson, Stephen Cote, Mark Armstrong, Michele Polo, I think, they were also using those models to think about public sector broadcasting. So advertising, funded television, the type of news that people can actually watch the uh, reasons for imposing particular restrictions on, on PSB, public sector broadcasting, that could have made sense in the olden days where people had a single channel. I think of the discussion here in the UK about the license fee to the BBC. Some regulation made sense where there were very few channels available as opposed to a multi-platform world. So I was wondering whether your model can also let us think about those important questions which are still out there. Um, a question uh, you have to give some answer to, obviously, it's a paper which has advertising and there is no discussion about the welfare implication of advertising, so uh, you have to, to say something. So it is just as exogenous R, we don't know what happens to the advertisers, we don't know what happens to the people buying advertised products, so you have to think a little bit about what's in the welfare function because it's Currently, it's just a positive R for any unit of, of attention, and there may be a bit more. So, more specific details, and, I'm, and then I'm done. Um, the attention constraint matters a lot in your results. And, and of course, we do have 24 hours a day, so I, I do see the, the practical impl impl implication. But I was thinking, why is that? Usually, some um, similar results you could get by making the attention cost function more convex. So I was wondering, or do you really need this uh, boundary solution? That wasn't entirely clear to me. It would be good. You have a representative agent. You have one consumer, which is representative of the economy. It would be good somehow to think about some dimension of heterogeneity, especially when it comes to monopoly. We do think that monopoly typically reduces demand. I know this is difficult in a zero price market, but to think about the typical effect of monopolies generating some meaningful uh, elastic demand could be uh, useful. The way you deal with competition wasn't too obvious to me. So you're talking about this limiting sequence of markets and uh, where attention is spread equally. That's uh, a very ingenious way. Uh, you refer to some literature from the 80s that I have to admit I'm not familiar with uh, from financial markets. Uh, apologies for that. But it, it wasn't the, the, the obvious way, the most obvious way to think of competition. In particular, since we're talking about uh, attention, if a consumer allocates um, attention across a certain number of platforms, the, the number of platforms ir is irrelevant, other things equal. And the, the level of utility is the same. If I think of my recent work with Andrea Pratt on attention oligopolies, instead, uh, it's a very different mechanism, of course, it's a different model, but there, if you can spread your attention across different platforms, basically attention is not a bottleneck, which means advertising is gonna be cheaper, which in our model means that new products can be seen and can be known and consumers are better off. Instead, when attention is spread over a very concentrated, very limited number of platforms, uh, the incumbent product firms can just hoard, can just preempt entry from happening. So in our model, for instance, attention, uh, sorry, the number of platforms directly 
benefits consumers, which you, you don't have, even if you don't have variety, etc. So in a sense, you have a model which is geared against the benefits of competition we typically think about. And maybe, maybe that's what you want to have, but having that monopoly can be best is also because you're ignoring some um, more typical channels. And finally, I didn't get, probably due to my uh, very quick reading, when there is competition, you seem to always have multi-homing. So, and, uh, and if there is always multi-homing, uh, it's a bit counterintuitive um, because we know that multi-homing is feasible in theory, but in practice, it doesn't happen very often. So, so if you could also put some more uh, nuances in, into that question, I think it would be useful. But it, it's, a, it's a great paper, which I enjoyed very much. And I, was, I was very happy to, to have the opportunity to discuss it. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Um, Shoto, I don't know if you want to reply, otherwise we also have some questions uh, ah, in the chat. Sure, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for the discussion. I think we have a lot to think. Yeah, I think for modeling the advertising market side and bit uh, richer welfare implication beyond consumer welfare, yeah, I think we are hopeful uh, in, in the sense that platforms pay of function can be quite general, generally depend on the attention profile. So I think we haven't tried, but I think it would be natural to think that yeah, detailed model of advertising or the matching between the background producer and the consumer. And right, and also one technical point of whether uh, why don't we replace attention constraint with a very steep cost function? So that's the little bit of weak point of our model that we have to have this varying attention constraint. Our hope have been that even though we drop off attention constraint and replace it with say steep attention cost, once we introduce the costly choice of addictiveness that I got question, uh, we still get that different magnitude incentive to introduce uh, increase D and continue to get the same uh, similar qualitatively the similar result. But that's more of a conjecture. Yeah, yeah I think I also got uh, many other variable feedback. So yeah, let me think. Thank you. Uh, so we have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, I don't know if you guys want to unmute yourselves and ask them in turn, um, Xiongyun, otherwise I can read the question out. Um, so so Xiongyun Kim asked um, whether you thought about the effect that network effects have um, in the model and whether they change the results at all. Uh, let me I maybe it depends on how we model the network effect, but I don't have an immediate intuition that network effect kills our results, but it should be possible to extend to the continuum of uh, at a certain point, identical consumers and each consumer's payoff also depends on the average attention that other consumers are allocating. 